CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nikki Lynch, first vice president of the club. President Lloyd Anderson is out of town and could not be with us today. Welcome to the City Club and to another special program. Today we focus on our city, the Willamette River, and our urban environment with City Commissioner Dan Salzman. I would like first to welcome a new member, Don Smith. Are you here? Welcome, Don. He's the, uh, with the Economic Development Consultant. Friday, October 8th, please join us for a stimulating update on the congressional conflict surrounding our national budget. You will recall that when he was here in July, Congressman Earl Blumenauer predicted that this fall's budget negotiations would be a train wreck. He'll be back next week to tell us about the process, the conflict, and the likely outcome. The program will be at the conference center at the Oregon Zoo. Please note the change of location, and remember, Max will drop you off immediately in front of the zoo entrance. All of you have received a letter requesting your support of this year's annual fund. Our goal for this millennium year is $100,000. You have a chance to have your gift doubled this year. A President's Challenge gift in the amount of $3,500 has been established to match every new gift of $25 or more. We are pleased to announce that we are already one-third of the way to our goal. Please help us reach that goal. October 14th, the club will host its first open house of the year at the club office. Join us for an opportunity to hear about club events, meet and talk with fellow members, and enjoy light refreshments. If you plan to attend, please RSVP with Winnie Kane at the club office. Our board host today, seated at the head table, is panel member Arnold Kogan, member of the Board of Governors and managing partner of Kogan, Owens, and Kogan. He will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Arnold's question, we will, be open, we will open the program to questions from the City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone even before Arnold is finished so that you can avoid any lag time between questions and that we have time to ask as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question. Please limit your questions to 30 seconds. Broadcast of the City Club program this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from the following. CH2M Hill, Weyerhaeuser, Pacific Care of Oregon. We are grateful for their support. Dan Salzman has had a long history of public involvement starting with his work as a legislative assistant to Congressman Ron Wyden. He has served on many boards and commissions, touching on a wide range of issues facing our community. He was twice elected Multnomah County Commissioner and is now serving his first year of a four-year term as Portland City Councilor, where he currently oversees the Bureau of Environmental Services, the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, the Bureau of Emergency Communications, Sustainable Portland Commission, Metropolitan Exposition Recreation Commission, Metropolitan Human Rights Center, and Domestic Violence Prevention. Dan has been a key player in local, regional, and statewide partnerships to integrate strategies of urban development with successful ecological restoration initiatives. Today, Dan will share his vision of an urban ecotopia and explain how Portland may someday transform this vision into reality. Dan Salzman. Thank you, uh, Nikki and Arnold and members of the City Club. Uh, I would like to thank the City Club, first of all, for having me here today. It was just a little more than one year ago that I stood before you as a candidate for this office in September of 98 in the uh, City Council debate. So I want to tell you that it's a real uh, honor, privilege, and relief to stand here today as your newest City Commissioner. 
The Urban Ecotopia, Integrating Urban Development and Ecological Restoration in Portland. It's a mouthful, and I can't take credit for that title. The City Club deserves that. But I thought the more I, liked, the more I thought about the title, the more I liked it. Because along with Tom McCall and the Bottle Bill and other parts of our history, Ecotopia was a book that helped create the legend of a Pacific Northwest so attuned to environmental protection that it actually established its own nation. And not only did that send an impression across the nation, but it also describes, I think, much of our self-image. Now, we've had some signal successes in taking the environmental initiative here in Oregon. We've got the bottle bill, the public beach laws, the 1970s cleanup of the Willamette River, the metro open space measure, just to name a few. But I'm not sure that we've really walked our talk to the extent that we would like to think. Growth, with its intendant and pressures on our land and water, is now revealing the superficiality of many of our efforts. We have come to think in terms of the dramatic gesture, the only in Oregon type of action or statement, and then we go back to our lives feeling good about ourselves. We are now past that, and we must shift our focus to deeper, ongoing approaches to protecting our environment. It is really time to understand and respect the fundamental connections of how we live, build, and grow. And the consequences of not acting are more apparent all the time. We have the Endangered Species Act listed. We have flooding. We have multiple river issues. We have landslides that affect streams and roads and the air quality and warming consequences of a more concentrated urban environment are just a few examples of the things we're seeing today. You know, by the simple addition of locusts, frogs, and hail, we could be talking about the Old Testament here. But it's not that bad. But we are facing some of the issues and are shouldering some significant cost in doing so. And today I want to talk to you frankly about changing our approach to environmental protection in the urban environment. I also want to report on you a couple of critical projects underway at the city right now. The Combined Sewage Overflow Project and a new initiative to encourage green buildings. When I talk about the need to shift our perspectives, I think I know of what I speak. I am an engineer by training. So I am a person who loves the elegant solution with the straight lines, love those pocket protectors, love those snazzy looking blueprints. But I'm also a politician, and nothing looks better to a politician than an issue that can be explained and, and solved and, a, and appear in a brochure in a nice, succinct paragraph. But reality is neither a straight line nor a soundbite. We must move beyond, we must move to the next phase of produce, protecting our environment and our livability a way of life and a value system that not only impacts our reputation as others look at us, but defines our very self-image, our very soul. In Portland and in Oregon, we have attempted to protect and preserve and enhance our environment. And many of those efforts have made a real difference, but some have been counterproductive. Take salmon recovery. For a long time, we thought that we had to take the logs out of the streams in order to help the salmon. Now we're putting them back in. Perhaps we can all benefit from this benefit of experience, but I'm reminded of what Oscar Wilde said. Experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. It's kind of like campaign finance reform. Today's reforms become tomorrow's abuse. Today we're talking about removing dams. Now those are pretty big logs, and it may end up being the right thing to do. But these big debates on dramatic actions often overshadow changes that have the potential to make a real difference in our lives. You know, much of what we concentrate our environmental protection efforts on reflects an approach that could be described as imposing the human intellectual design or structure on a natural world that lives by its own rules. And that is beginning to change, but I don't think it's changing fast enough. And let me offer you an illustration, and I offer myself as, as the example, the own victim. I am proudly in charge of the Bureau of Environmental Services as a city commissioner. A job, I might add, that Willamette Week said I was nuts for wanting to have. And as you know, sewers are a big deal for us. Historically, they are the primary way in which we attempted to protect the quality of our rivers and streams. Now, we have the sewer pipe crossing Johnson Creek in southeast Portland. It needed to be fixed, shored up so it wouldn't collapse. Well, in the process of fixing it, we found a beaver dam. And we had the, pro the reaction that was probably the results of thousands of years of engineering inbreeding. It's in the way, it could threaten the pipe, it must be removed so our efforts to protect water quality may proceed unobstructed. 
It's an understandable reaction, but it's wrong. While we were busily trying to engineer our way to a, cleaner to a cleaner water, nature had a better way. If one takes a longer term, broader outlook at the health of our streams and rivers, that beaver dam was very important. It was good for a recovering salmon and trout population, and it was good for the beaver. And it was also keeping more in line with our new approach to Johnson Creek to reduce flooding and to boost salmon runs by allowing the creek to return to its natural state, even purchasing properties along the way, along the creek, to get there. Does that mean we should have let the sewer line collapse? Of course not. But we should have recognized that both the sewer line and the beaver dam had an important role to play and found a way to allow them to coexist. Now, removing the beaver dam was a mistake that won't happen while I'm still around, again. But it is important that this mistake be understood for what it really is. It's a powerful example of how our thinking must change. The removal of the beaver dam reflects our historic approach to environmental protection. We react to a problem that human nature has created by building an additional human habitation or human structure to mitigate that problem. But there is an emerging school of thought that offers a better approach. Instead of traditional engineering, I like to call it green engineering. And green engineering simply means building, developing, and growing in a way that reduces the environmental impacts of our presence. It gives real meaning to what I believe to be one of the most important environmental admonitions of our day. The era of mastering nature must give way to the era of living in harmony with our environment. Or another way to say it is living lightly on the land. Now, living lightly on the land is a fine piece of rhetoric, and I know in Oregon we love our environmental rhetoric, but right now is the time to make that rhetoric more of a reality. We are in the midst right now of a rush of commercial development and growth that will redefine our community. It will also stretch our environment's ability to absorb that growth unless we change the way we do it. Last month, I sponsored and the City Council passed a resolution to develop a green building action plan. Simply put, its goal is to change the way we develop using siting and design as an intrinsic part of environmental protection. Some examples of green building strategies and their benefits are that we have the technology to dramatically reduce energy and water consumption in new buildings. This environmental benefit also has a financial benefit because less money is spent on treating pollution, laying pipe, etc. Also, by linking building plans with transportation and existing infrastructure, we can minimize the site disturbance and increase incentives to develop brownfields instead of plowing under more greenfields. And we can change building practices at the site level to reduce the impacts of fish and on fish and wildlife, to improve the quality of our rivers and streams, and to reduce sprawl. Green building could also have an impact on the rainwater runoff problems or stormwater. There are a big reason why we must spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the combined sewer overflow project. On-site stormwater retention, keeping it where it comes down to the, from the rain, helps and reduce building footprints. Using things like green roofs or roof gardens and porous paving systems are all ways that can make a substantial difference to the amount of stormwater we have. And in case you're think, if you're tempted to think that changing building practices is simply sort of tinkering around the margins, consider these two facts. 54% of U.S. energy consumption is directly or indirectly related to buildings and their construction, and buildings account for 35% of the annual U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. The principles and approach embedded in green building go beyond buildings or green engineering. They're also reflected in other policy changes that I'm working on. Uh, myself and Commissioner Sten, in fact, are advocating a move to conservation pricing of water, making it more expensive when you use large amounts of water rather than providing discounts now for those large amounts. Again, it's a matter of looking at water as a resource to be protected and not a commodity to simply be transported and to be sold. And once again, it means broadening our field of vision beyond a particular engineering endeavor to the greater impact of our decisions on the entire ecosystem. We also recently at the City Council passed a tree preservation ordinance that says simply, if you cut one down, you must replace it or pay into a fund that will plant trees in the same watershed. Now this isn't a massive policy change, nor did it cost millions of dollars to accomplish, 
but it does reflect a long-term vision on the importance of our tree canopy to help water quality, to help air quality, and soil erosion problems. And significantly, it will help us avoid the heavier cost of addressing those problems down the road. So let me be clear about one thing. The things I'm talking about are not free. There is a price to do it right. It costs more, as it stands today, it costs more to build extra green features into buildings, commercial or residential buildings. But I believe that the short-term cost is more than justified by the long-term gain. Things such as saving utility costs for owners and occupants, tenants of buildings, cleaner air, cleaner water, and a better living environment for all of us, and also profits for local industries who become the leaders in the creation of the green building design and construction techniques. Also, I want to let you know that we have a chance to apply the principles of green engineering to the second most expensive public works project in Oregon's history, the Combined Sewer Overflow Project. This project is critically important to our community and our region's future. And it's a classic version of having to spend a fortune to rectify our past mistakes. We have to address the combined sewage overflows, and we have an agreement with the state and federal government to do so. But we also have a golden opportunity to integrate into the project a broader perspective that will be better for our environment and the quality of life in the long run. Now, if you think back to the Johnson Creek sewer pipe, for an example, for instance, in a sense, the CSO project, or combined sewer overflow, is currently the equivalent of shoring up that pipeline across Johnson Creek. It's a purely engineering solution to the problem. Our opportunity, the golden opportunity, is to employ more of the river, the beaver dam approach by incorporating a broader vision of river health and shifting some of our investment to green investment that will reduce the long-term need for concrete. This would mean some trade-offs in how the project is currently designed, but I believe those are trade-offs well worth considering. The Willamette River has sustained us for thousands of years with food, drinking water, transportation, irrigation water, and comfort from its beauties. And we have mistreated it. For over a hundred years, we paid the river back by using it as a disposal system for our waste. We dammed it for power and flood control, we dredged it, we diked it, and we changed its character to suit our needs. And unlike many great rivers in this country, the Willamette is entirely within the state of Oregon, so we have nowhere else to look or no one else to blame for our mistakes. As I mentioned earlier, the primary response we have made is a sewer system. Now originally our sewer system wasn't designed to protect the river, but rather to efficiently collect and dispose of sewage and stormwater into the river. After World War II, we built a sewage treatment plant, and we've increased our capacity to treat wastewater ever since. We created a combined sewer system that intercepted the stormwater when it rains and adds it to the wastewater flowing to the treatment plant. Too much rain, and it overflows into the river. It was a state-of-the-art design when we built it. But since Portland continued to grow, we have more stormwater going into the sewer system than soaking into the ground. In 1990, we estimated the overflows to be about 6 billion gallons a year, which is down from 10 billion gallons a year in 1972, and we are now, in 1999, at 3.2 billion gallons a year. So we have made a lot of progress. Faced with litigation over this issue, the city signed an agreement with the Oregon DEQ, which committed the city to reduce the volume of our combined sewer overflows uh, by 99% over a 20-year period. At the time, few details were known about the cost or which approach would work the best, but the commitment was made. Meanwhile, our watersheds, the Columbia Slough, Johnson Creek, Bano Creek, Tryon Creek, and Balch Creek have been covered, filled, and run through culverts to make more land available. The negative impact on the watersheds is a direct negative impact on the Willamette River also. The city developed the basic combined sewer overflow strategy in 1991. The strategy had three components. Number one, get stormwater out of the system to make the problem smaller. The more stormwater you get out of the system, the fewer overflows you will have. The fewer overflows, the smaller the ultimate big fix needs to be. Number two was to clean up the Columbia Slough first by controlling the overflows from the 13 Columbia Slough outfalls by the year 2001. And I'm pleased to say we are well on the way to meeting that goal. 
Number three is to control the outflows, the overflows from the 42 Willamette River outfalls by the year 2011, which is exactly 20 years from 1991. By 1993, however, it was clear that this would be an enormous task. And while the preliminary engineering was done, the cost estimate topped $1 billion to accomplish this effort. And with virtually no state or federal money available, all of this money has to be paid by you, the ratepayers. The city then worked with the Oregon DEQ staff and members of the Oregon Environmental Quality Commission to develop a revised plan that adjusted the target from 99% volume reduction on the Willamette to 94% volume reduction. That change alone will save ratepayers over $300 million and result only in an expected four overflow events per year. And that plan is working. By the end of next year, for the total investment we have made so far of $300 million, combined sewer overflow volumes have been cut by approximately 53% over the level they were in 1991. So in just eight years, we have surpassed the halfway mark on our journey. And to do this, we have more than doubled sewer rates. A typical residential family was paying $14 per month for sewer services in 1991, and is now paying $32 a month. But as we face the rest of our task, I believe we need to pause and think for a moment about the best way to complete it. And I believe that calls for broad vision beyond a single engineering approach or project. To accomplish this vision, we will have to think differently than we have in the past. Take the problem of the combined sewer overflows. For all the successes it has had so far, our current approach attacks the problem from only one single dimension, and that is to reduce the amount of bacteria entering our river. The solution agreed to involves digging big tunnels on either side of the Willamette and spending another $400 million to tackle what remains of that one problem. Like our original sewer system, it was state-of-the-art when we designed it, but a great deal has changed since the 1994 combined sewer overflow order was signed. Technology has changed. It always does. We have learned from the success and failures of other communities in dealing with similar combined sewer overflow problems. We know more about the quality of the Willamette River when it enters Portland. And we now have a fish listing pursuant to the Endangered Species Act. And there's also another very important dynamic at work here, too. As we get closer to that ultimate target of 94%, the last increment of that amount, achieving that goal, costs a lot more money than it does to go from the first 50 or 60 or 70%. That's kind of the, one of those laws of nature. So it's a lot more expensive to achieve that last increment of reduction. So what I'm advocating is that before we pour a lot more very expensive concrete, shouldn't we make sure that we're taking advantage of what we have learned? I believe that the overall restoration of our rivers, streams, and watersheds, and simple common sense recommends that we do all we can to reduce the quantity of and the amount of pollution from stormwater before it gets to the river. What I advocate for we call a phased adaptive approach. This would allow us to make extensive use of innovative techniques, such as on-site stormwater, using stormwater on-site again, instead of dumping it into the sewers. One example of this is our very popular downspout disconnection program in north and northeast Portland. Building more wetlands, getting smarter about the miles and getting smarter about the impacts of the miles and miles of pavement on stormwater, the amount of stormwater that's generated, and restoring stream banks by planting trees and native plants. We need to think about these options prior to making the financial and engineering commitments, and prior to getting involved with building large diameter tunnels to collect and store mixed stormwater and sewage. Once those tunnels are sized and built at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars, we're committed to that solution. There's no going back. So I suggest we consider other options before setting, starting to build the big tunnels that give us better environmental results for the dollars invested. I also believe we must better coordinate the efforts of the city's bureaus to make sure that watershed health is one of their priorities. And this is already well underway with the city's response to the Endangered Species Act. Finally, I believe we must also broaden the base of funding for watershed health restoration. Right now, all that money comes solely from you, the ratepayer. With sewer rates having doubled, more than doubled since 1991, we have questions about just how much our ratepayers can afford. 
And if we do not find ways to broaden the financial base, rates will have to double again in the next 10 years. Basically, this all gets back to the point I was making earlier in this speech. Look beyond single engineering fixes for problems that are more complex and that lend themselves to more holistic solutions. I favor more than just digging tunnels to solve one dimension of the problem. I believe we must take advantage of the tools at our disposal to restore all of our rivers and streams in Portland to good health. And both the EPA and the Oregon DEQ will need to support what we are trying to do to accomplish this. But now is the time to look beyond what should be done to remove CSOs from the Willamette River. We need to address all the problems facing the river and our urban streams. Now I know that some of these recommendations will make my friends in the environmental community nervous. I understand their apprehension of any delay or any changing of the targets. But as the city decides in the next several months, I hope that those in the environmental community will understand this evolution of a CSO strategy as a victory. It is a result of a more rational and holistic view of protecting our water, our river, and our ecosystems. We must not undermine our own success by clinging to yesterday's technologies and yesterday's solutions and visions. So in conclusion, I want to quote one of my mentors and truly, to my mind, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. And I've got that quote right there. <laughs> Kermit the Frog once sang, it isn't easy being green. Well, it isn't. But it's very possible and worth the effort. The search for an urban ecotopia will not end in a single elegant solution, but in changing our mindset towards the discovery of hundreds of ways to let nature instruct us. It will require more thought, more hard work, and yes, more investment. But if we commit ourselves, we will reap a tremendous benefit in the long term. The people in this room all have an important role to play in supporting this public policy direction. And you will be hearing from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Is this guy going to stay here? Or, or, yeah, well, that's fine. We can give. <laughs> I'll just move him to one side for a minute here. Um, I have the honor of asking the first question, and, and Dan, you've outlined a uh, an excellent um, program that uh, has been carried forward so far to create a greener, and more sustainable community. Um, perhaps you could share with us. Uh, I think it would be interesting to all of us. Uh, a two-part question. One: uh, What have you found during this first year? of um, public office to be the most difficult decision that you had to face in, in bringing us to the point we are now uh, in creating this uh, greener, uh, more sustainable community. And what do you see in the coming year as probably the most difficult decision you're going to have to make uh, coming up? Uh, before I answer Arnold's question, I would like to, first of all, uh, just point out that at each of your chairs is a ballot, a Clean River, Clean River Plan ballot. And this outlines some of the various issues related to our combined sewer overflow and some of the options that we're looking at. And we encourage, the, we, we mailed this to every household in the city, but we encourage you to take this ballot and give us your input as well and mail it to us. Uh, we're still taking the results. Uh, and I also just wanted to acknowledge that we have in the room here Dean Marriott, who is also the director of the Bureau of Environmental Services. The uh, biggest challenges, I think, uh, is really making, moving from beyond the talk about green buildings and what nice things they are, and really making them happen and providing and looking at perhaps providing economic incentives to make them happen. Uh, it's a lot, you know, we can all talk about green building, we can all say the right things about sustainable development, but sort of sorting those out and figuring out what specifically they are and how to develop incentives to make it happen is clearly one of the things I'm very much in the middle of right now. In fact, by December 1st, we hope to come back to City Council with some green building action plans. And probably the, the biggest decision that I will face in the, in the months ahead will be what course of action we pursue on our combined sewer overflow. And I think probably it's difficult because while I've talked to you about the need to broaden our perspectives and not focus on engineering approaches that just solve one problem, uh, it's a lot of times it's hard to get that 
convey that to the public when you're talking about reduction levels of 99% versus 94% or something else. Uh, people tend to focus too much on that 99, 94 and not look at the old broader impact of what that lesser target may allow us to do in terms of more broad-based watershed health investments. Good afternoon. My name is Rex Burkholder, City Club member. And I want to go back, hi Kermit, uh, I want to go back to your green building code idea. And recently I've been building an accessory dwelling unit in my backyard and have gone then through the city permit system and see some of the things I think I'd like your opinion on is what can we take away from the building requirements and building codes that are not green but also add to the cost. And the particular one is off-street parking requirements. Uh, the average garage costs about $17,000 that's added to the cost of a house and also the whole row house and snout house issue. A lot of that's derived because the city requires you to provide off-street parking. And most of our neighborhoods have plenty of parking on the street. We've already paved it. And yet the city is requiring us to pave more plus raising the cost of our housing. What do you feel about that? And I'm sure there's other areas we can go to well, as well. I, certainly we need to have more flexibility in our building codes. And we also need to have people who work in our, in our building codes departments who understand green investments or are doing things differently. And in fact, that is one of the other problems now is that we can have architects, designers, building developers coming up with the best ideas, but if it's gonna cause a stall at the Bureau of Buildings because they don't have people with the expertise to analyze this or their engineers are nervous and they're gonna say, I don't like this kind of new stuff, I, you know, let's just go with the pipe. Uh, we have to, you know, that's gonna stall their plans and, and in this world, time is money. So that's one of the other big things of our Green Building Action Plan is to look at making sure that we if we move forward with an aggressive set of incentives, that we also have the expertise necessary so that those projects don't get gummed up in the works. Matteo Lucio, City Club member. Uh, you mentioned that you and Eric are working on conservation pricing for water, and I'm not, not sure how, uh, what approach you're taking on that, but I just had an idea I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I don't want to put you on the spot on the details, but maybe you can comment on the, sort of the principle. Uh, what if we came up with some kind of reasonable amount of uh, gallons per person per day, which in the case of residential uh, water service, it would be you know per household member. In the case of a health club, would be members of the club. In the case of restaurant, would be customers, whatever. And then up to that point, there would be a certain rate, and it would go sh sharply up from that point on you know, if they exceeded that amount of water. So again, basing the price on the number of individuals and sort of tying it to individual consumption. Right. Uh, and that's exactly the, the concept, I mean, you articulated it right there, is, is that you're priced according to how much water you use. And uh, I think that's behind our, our, the changes we're looking at, is basically saying right now if you purchase large quantities, you can start getting discounted rates. A, large, a lot of this is true more for industries than for single family households. But what we're looking at is giving people more control over their own destiny, and by doing that through a consumption-based charge that really reflects the amount of water they consume. I don't know about you know, adopting some sort of a, a status quo figure for how much an individual consumes, how much a household consumes, but I think those are implicit in our rate structure and where we decide what, what is gonna be the first break point that you start paying a higher cost for that additional water. And I'm sure it'll be based on some typical daily household use, uses. Hi, Dan. Erwin Mandel, City Club member. Uh, I was delighted to hear you introduce transportation as part of your ecosystem for the city. I imagine Ray Polani is even gladder. Uh, but I know. <laughs> what I'd like you to do is comment on what seems to me to be sort of a split brain attitude in Portland about public transportation versus private transportation. Everybody's glad to see the Greyhound bus station go away. It's been an eyesore, admittedly. But somehow the notion of a nine-story parking garage topped by a 10-story hotel right on Taylor in the dead center of town encouraging more cars to come in. In fact, so many that they're having a three-car lane in and out, depending on that. In addition to which, we have uh, in the works what I've come to learn is called the West End Plan. One of the aspects, or two of the aspects of the plan is to change residential zoning in the area between 9th and 12th Avenue and... Uh, yeah, a comment from Dan, okay. <laughs> 
But oh, the issue is going to be that they're also looking for an exception to be able to put freestanding parking garages there. We give lip service to the need for public transportation, and yet we're also seemingly encouraging more automobiles into the heart of town. Somehow this doesn't make, to me at least, a decent ecosystem. Can you comment on that? Well, I think that's, you know, I think you're right, or when you say there's sort of a split brain, I like that, that description. I mean, we do have sort of this split brain when it comes to transit and auto use. Uh, all I could say is that, you know, we, we need to strike the right balance, and I think we recognize that we're simply not, you know, reliance on the automobile alone is only going to get us into more problems, more roads, more pavement, more stormwater runoff, and it's, uh, you know, we've got to have something else to balance that out. Jim Zarin, City Club member, Hadan. Um, maybe another split brain question. Um, you, uh, your green building proposal was criticized in the Oregonian, and I'm sure by others, for layering yet more requirements on the development community inside the city of Portland. And I think the, the editorial in the Oregonian suggested, if it didn't say, that that puts us perhaps at a, yet another competitive disadvantage compared to the, our surrounding jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. I also know you're very active in Metro and supportive of a regional approach to a lot of things. Do you see a trade-off there on being more aggressive on, uh, for example, requiring more investment at the front end and a green building approach in the city when other jurisdictions aren't taking that approach? And how does that put us in the regional scheme of things? Do you see a trade-off yeah, there? Uh, well, first of all, the, we're not looking at doing anything in terms of a requirement, per se, at this point. What we're looking at is developing some sort of economic incentive to say to the, the tremendous people that, I mean, the tremendous number of building that will be going on in the next three to five years. Here is a way to basically keep the cost, I mean, the cost of doing green things costs more now. And if we can somehow reduce that increment that it costs to do the green things, then we think they'll do the green things and do them right. And that there's all sorts of ancillary benefits to us, the public, uh, from those investments. I would hope that uh, other localities in the region would, would see that we've done what we do is so fantastically successful uh, that they will emulate it. Uh, but it's always, a, I mean, you can always approach these things from the thou shalt approach too and, and do the regulations, but I think we've learned that that's probably not the best approach to come out of the box with. Uh, and I do think that the, uh, many developers I've talked to are, are taking a lead on helping us build this green action plan because they really believe it in what they're doing. And uh, so I think that's, uh, hopefully it'll be something we've developed in the other areas in the metropolitan area will we'll emulate. Yes. Sharon Chanassi, I live in northwest Portland. I want to first of all congratulate you and others in the city for the wonderful work that you're beginning to do on water and for really bringing attention to the serious water pollution problems we have here because we rely on, this, on the river so much. But there's one big area which I'm sure you know um, was missing from your talk and that was a discussion of the growing air pollution problem here we have in Portland. Um, some of us in northwest Portland and other areas of the city who live right next to um, uh, in big industrial areas are getting a very heavy dose of pollution that we've discussed with you in the past. Right. Um, you mentioned that the mistakes that were made in the past of using the water as a disposal system, that's exactly what we're doing with our air shed. Now, what is a city going to do to prevent the kind of huge cleanup costs and, and future problems down the road by not doing anything about the air pollution problems we have right now. Yeah. Well, I know that the problem you're concerned about in Northwest is with particular toxic air emissions from many of the industries along Northwest Front Avenue. And I believe that is an issue, as you've raised it, that we need to look at. And we are taking a look at it. I believe DEQ is also taking a look at that, too. The reason you didn't hear me talk so much about air quality is today's focus was really sort of on water, the water side of the issue. But uh, let me tell you that things like uh, roof gardens, uh, using stormwater on site, those things all have the potential to have positive air quality benefits as well. Uh, in as much as there's been some fascinating research EPA has been conducting that shows that what we call the heat island effect, the impact of an urban environment, of the heat that a building absorbed, that pavement absorbs, and then let off again, how that increases air pollutant formation too. I mean, ozone, basically you cook ozone, you cook two pollutants to make ozone. And so when we have these urban heat island effects, they're creating more pollution. Uh, so that's, that's, to me, that's one of the more profound ways of getting at this issue. Uh, how we deal with the toxic air pollutants that you're speaking of is probably gonna have to come through the old fashioned command and control, just saying to the source, you've got to find a way to, to make the, the emissions as near to zero as you can possibly get. 
but on a broader one, we need to look at how our, how our environmental decisions can also influence our air quality decisions. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Um, the problem with the runoff is clearly pavement. And pavement, of course, is automobiles. It's, it's road space and it's parking. Um, if we want to address the problem seriously, I think we've got to address the problem of the automobile and the lack of alternative, which is good, efficient, and uh, frequent transit. Uh, for that, we need money. So how would you feel about finally asking the voters for the permission to switch some of the money from the pavement to the alternative to transit? Well, I'm very supportive of that alternative. Well, I'm not sure, got I'm not sure the voters <laughs> of the state of Oregon are. That's, the, that's been our problem before, is trying to uh, use gas tax monies for things other than, than road-related enhancement. And when I talked about the need to broaden the base of uh, financial support for watershed health restoration, what I meant, I mean, that's basically code for saying that uh, the roads contribute about half the stormwater that our system sees, yet we do not collect anything. None of that gas tax money goes towards helping us keep the drainage systems uh, clean and, and maintain that, that, that public investment. So I'm very supportive, but you know, we've, we've been down that road before, and, and I'm certainly supportive of taking another, another shot at it. But you know, you know as well as I do, it's a tough one to win. It shouldn't be, but it is. Okay. Commissioner Steve Schell. Um, there's a comment that somebody made along the line that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Um, the pattern of democracies is kind of littered with plans that have ab been abandoned along the way. We've raised a billion dollars for this combined sewer overflow. At one point, uh, your Bureau of Environmental Services uh, had a plan to uh, split up the treatment so that there could be collectors at various points. One was planned for Swan Island. Mm -hmm. uh, there was talk about another one in the River District, talk about another one up at, uh, uh, in the, the McAdam area. Uh, you've abandoned that set of plans and we're moving down from the 99% to the 94%. Um, I wonder if you could go through why these plans have been abandoned with a little more detail and and tell us the reasoning of uh, the Bureau in this uh, area. Okay. Uh, first of all, the 99% level was what we changed in 1993. That's when we got the new target reduction of 94%. The uh, construction of the treatment plants, uh, basically we were looking at various alternatives when we build these big pipes on either side of the river uh, to take the stormwater and the wastewater to the treatment plant, which is down on Columbia Boulevard. Uh, we looked at the possibility of having sort of intermediary treatment plants that would handle smaller volumes and discharge uh, into the Willamette. And that's primarily the reason we abandoned the idea is, is uh, because of the discharge to the Willamette River. Uh, you all know probably that the upper portion of the Willamette between the Broadway Bridge and the Columbia River now is, is being considered as a potential Superfund site. Well, if we had a treatment plant on Swan Island, we would be discharging right into that Superfund site. So we felt that wasn't a good idea. And we also felt that it wasn't going to be a good idea for, for overall fish, fish protection as well. Uh, as to why we why we change plans and, and what we're going to be doing, the city council is going to reach a decision in the next two months and that will be what's going to govern us. But the reason we're even considering change is because we've learned a lot how to do things smarter and greener. The old plan, as I said, is just based on, like I said, building big pipes, piping it to the system. We've got to really, if we're going to get aggressive about reducing stormwater volumes, we've got to get aggressive about green investments, restoring our watershed health. And those are things that, uh, we didn't uh, fully appreciate probably five years, even five years ago, as, as the way to really approach these problems. If we could do the green investments first, see how much stormwater flow we can reduce, then we can ultimately size the pipes. And if we can size them smaller, we're going to save a lot of money. I'm Don Sterling, a member of the club. Uh, before long, Dan, God willing, you members of the city council will finally have a chance to pass on the Southwest Community Plan, which has been under study for I think about four or five years now. One of the things that that study has, has certainly revealed is a deficiency in stormwater accommodations in southwest Portland out in the vicinity of Multnomah and so forth. Uh, especially if we're going to accommodate more density within the city in that area. Uh, is the, Department, uh, the Bureau of Environmental Quality working at all on plans to improve the stormwater drainage situation in southwest Portland? Uh, yes, I think the, the southwest community plan one of its, its 
accurate criticisms, I think, of the city was the fact that we were talking about adding all this density without looking at those very issues you said. You know, what about the roads not being paved? What about the lack of stormwater drainage? And that's not just in southwest Portland. We have those same problems in uh, southeast Portland, too. Uh, so I think the Southwest Community Plan really sort of jarred, our, jarred us, not just the Bureau of Environmental Services, really the city to think more about tying our long-range planning to our long-range plan, long range infrastructure investment plans as well. And in fact, we have done that right now. The city is working on a growth analysis summary that's really going to be able to tell us this is how much infrastructure investment we're going to be looking at to really make Southwest uh, have the type of uh, environment that we envision it in the plan. But it'll be not just for Southwest, it'll be for all parts of the city too. As I said, the, the Gateway Town Center folks are wondering how are, we, how are we designating Gateway a town center when we're not doing anything different there with the way people arrive there or, or how the, the infrastructure exists. So we're trying to tie that all together and it's something in the ideal world all cities should be doing all the time. Uh, all I can say is in the eight months I've been here I think we're getting better at thinking about the capital side of investments needing to accompany the vision side of the plans. Hi, Barbara Clark, City Club member. Um, I'm thinking about construction in the winter months when the wet weather um, causes erosion and um, silt going into the water system. Is there anything the city can do to um, improve that situation? Uh, yes, so that's almost like a planted question, Barbara. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be happy to know that uh, I think later on this month, uh, or perhaps November, uh, the city will be adopting a whole new uh, erosion control guidelines. And it will, it will basically beef up a lot of our ability to stop uh, if we see development occurring that's not uh, playing by the rules in terms of erosion control, stream bank protection. Uh, it basically puts these things at a very high priority. It consult coordinates the enforcement. Oftentimes there's an enforcement glitch between the Bureau of Buildings and Bureau of Environmental Services. This solves it. We'll have sort of one person whose job it is is to be to know all the answers or to get those answers. And, and I'll also say, when I first came into office in, in January, uh, I was made aware of some alarming developments going on in southeast Portland on the Powell Buttes. And I went out there, took a look, and I was very disturbed at what I saw. And what I saw were basically lots of soil sediment going into very clean tributaries of Johnson Creek. And it was because of these massive residential developments going up there, and it was raining a lot. And the protection measures they had were, were tepid at best. They were not genuinely giving it the same degree of significance they would as, say, pouring a concrete driveway. So I was able to get the city council to adopt some interim re regulations that they are in existence right now that give us the ability to tell developers that they're not doing a good job, that we can either limit the amount of soil they have exposed at one time, or we can even limit the time of year that they can go in and do their activities. And it's to respond to those types of issues. Thank you. Ask it from here. When we had the, uh, the research, we did the research on the ESA, one of the topics that came up was possibly spending some of that money outside the city, I even mean, the money that we might be spending on the, you know, overrun, the sewage overrun up the river further where the dollars could have more impact. Is that something that's, that, that has that, any possibility? That is a very valid point. Whether it has any political possibility is probably nil. Uh, and, and let me say, first of all, there's plenty of things we could be spending our money on in our part of the Willamette River and our local watersheds in terms of making them better and restoring them to health. But when you get into the whole issue, I mean, one of the problems about the Willamette is there are so many jurisdictions and there are so many groups looking at it. Uh, and we, you know, somebody has to step forward and we've got to look at it as a river basin. Governor Kitzhaber has, has started some efforts on that. Uh, I don't really know where they are, but I know that you know, Commissioner Sten serves on the, the stakeholder task force. Uh, but yeah, we know that the quality of the Willamette River leaves something to be desired when it enters Portland. And uh, so that's why Despite what all we do down here, it could all be for naught unless other things occur upstream in terms of changing agricultural runoff practices, uh, again, runoff from pavement into the river, things like that. So it, it is a big problem. It needs to be addressed on a river-wide basin, but I don't think we're going to see Portland uh, ratepayer money being used for anything beyond Portland investments. Yep. Uh, Dan, I have a question about the visual environment of the city. I'm the chair of the City Club's billboard committee. Uh, we did a study a few years ago uh, supporting the city's adoption of a new uh, sign ordinance <coughs> which limited billboards to 200 square feet. Um, however, there were two major um, uh, things that were not addressed in the, in the sign code. One was wall signs and the other is moving image signs. And video signs popped up and shocked everybody in this council last 
February put a ban on them. So I'm, I'd like to know your thinking about maintaining that ban into the future. Well, as you said, we did pass a ban in February. And uh, when, we, when we enacted that ban, there were about, there were three or four video signs that everybody saw right away. When we enacted the ban, there were about another five to eight sign locations that had already been into our permitting shop. So we were ordered to issue them permits, and that's why you've seen some of them now going up on Broadway and, and other places around the city. Uh, and again, we are being sued, as just about everything we do in the area of <laughs> sign regulation seems to, uh, seems to result. So I can't tell you, I mean, I think the city council's fairly insistent upon maintaining the moving image sign ban, but I can't tell you whether we're gonna be, how successful we'll be at upholding that ban. But I think we're on solid ground. I mean, and the city club has helped us a lot, I think, in sort of our whole approach to signage. And what's, you know, what's the constitutional way to do it and what's the, the unconstitutional way to do it? Oh. Oh. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming and we are adjourned. Yeah. Hi there, Fred. Yeah. Hi there. Hi there.